everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad that you are here. Uh, before you're concerned about my mic not being on, I'll tell you that it's only for Eric back there with the um, camera, and so it's not for purposes of amplification, so, so don't worry about that. Um, my name is Shauna Lee Whitney, for those of you who don't know me. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Journalism and Communication and have been at UAA for um, a long time, 20 years at this point. Um, and I am thrilled this afternoon to be wearing my cafe hat. I still teach classes, but I'm also the interim director of cafe. And I'm thrilled this afternoon to be welcoming Dr. Michael Sweet from Northeastern University um, to teach you some things about flipped classrooms. Um, I want to say in introducing Michael that um, I had an opportunity to hear him speak at a team-based learning conference. Are you okay, Libby? Okay, um, <laughs> I had he an opportunity to he hear him speak about um, learning at, at a team-based learning conference, and I knew in that moment that, that he had things that, that would really benefit our faculty at UAA. Um, and, I, and speaking of you know, our faculty at UAA, I want to mention that there are, this morning there were about 61 people registered for this session, including um, you know, all of you in the room, as well as people who are attending via distance using Blackboard Collaborate, and we've got folks who are helping them. Um, and I think it's really exciting that there are faculty from the Anchorage campus participating in this, faculty who are in Kodiak and participating, um, you know, just, just across the system, all our community campuses and so on are really involved in this too. And I, I felt like that conversation that I had with the people in that session where I heard Michael speak mm. were a really important part of my learning as a professional, right? These cross-disciplinary kinds of conversations, cross-campus conversations can be a really powerful part of our doing our jobs better and helping increase student success and helping them have really powerful moments of deep learning. And that's why we're here, right? That's, that's what it's all about. So I knew that um, I needed to find a way to get Michael up here to talk with you, and I'm really thrilled that, that we've been able to do that. I also want to take a moment and thank Michael for coming not only um, to Alaska, but um, to say welcome home, because Michael was born and raised in Fairbanks. And so he is a great <laughs> example, it's true, his folks still live up there, he's a great example of, of what happens when people have these powerful learning experiences. You know, they, they end up, um, some stay in Alaska, some go other places, but it, it's all about getting out there and, you know, doing the things that you are meant to do in this life. And so I'm really thrilled that, that he's been able to, to come back home to Alaska. We've had calls in cafe with people saying, is that the same Michael Sweet that's from <laughs> Fairbanks? We said, yeah, it is. And people saying, I went to junior high with him. <laughs> so, so we're really excited that he's here. And I want to say, just, just personally for me to you, Michael, I have a little gift for you um, that I hope will give you a little flavor of Alaska when you go back to Boston. This is a, a packet. For those of you who haven't seen this, this is some powerful stuff. This is Alaska pure sea salt that comes from the Gulf of Alaska, and it's, it's made in Sitka. And um, this particular flavor is Sitka spruce tip, and it is fabulous hmm. on wild Alaska salmon. <laughs> and if you are in Boston, you better not be buying that farmed Atlantic stuff. We want you to be buying wild Alaska salmon. Yes, ma'am. So. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. That's You're super welcome. nice of you. Yeah. Aw. I don't know what Sitka spruce tips taste like, but soon I will. It's really good. Delicious. Awesome. So Thank enjoy you. it. All right. And enjoy the presentation with Michael. All right. Yeah, it's actually cool to be back in Alaska. Can everybody hear me pretty well? All right, groovy. Um, so today uh, we are going to be um, doing some flipping, talking about flipping. I sent out a pre reading. Um, if not everybody read it, that's cool, actually, because that simulates an undergraduate classroom where there's this. <laughs> Uh, like uneven amount of preparation, like literally, that's, that's fine, that's completely fine. Um, I do know when you come to a workshop and it says up there, please sit with people you don't know, and you've arrived with someone who you know, it's kind of weird to just sort of sit at separate tables and blink at each other from across the room and like not, not have anything to talk to because there's no one at your table yet, but we're here now. So can I ask you, because I happen to know many of you sat with people you know, can I ask you to stand up and redistribute yourselves so that you are actually at tables, at least with some folks you don't know? Uh, 
All right. Thank you for doing that. And there's, there's, a, there's a method to my madness there, and that is that um, if you know each other, you're going to be having conversations about what happened later. And if you were at the same table, you would have had the same conversations and learned the same stuff. This way, you'll be talking to people you don't know, and you'll have more to share with each other later. Right? So you'll get more, more bang for the buck. Um, so uh, today, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be really doing three things. We're going to experience the flip. And that's why I sent the pre-reading out. Um, we're going to talk about why one flips briefly, the, the research behind it. And actually, I have a little video of someone uh, who I worked with at Northeastern to kind of show you what she learned, which is actually mirrored in the literature. And then finally, we're going to consider what it's going to look like to flip in your class a little bit. There is a diversity in this room of people who have experienced flipping versus people who have not. Um, so I'm going to do my best to drop some stuff in there for advanced folks. And most of the conversation is going to be sort of about the foundations and getting started in a, in a positive way. Um, but uh, I, I beg your indulgence if, uh, for example, team-based learning is something that I've been passionate about for a long time. There's folks in the room who have been doing team-based learning, which is a flipped class pedagogy. Team-based learning was flipping before flipping was cool. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to be doing some things that might look familiar to team-based learning folks. Uh, I'm not necessarily advocating TBL as the only flipped pedagogy out there because there's others, Pogol, um, peer instruction. There's all kinds of great stuff. Um, but uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that there may be moments where you're like, oh, yeah, I do this. I've been doing this for a while, Michael. What else you got? Um, so here we go. So that being said, um, uh, I do, while we're having conversations, I'm not a terribly formal guy, as you may have guessed. I'm an Alaskan, right? Um, and so we'll be doing activities and things like that, but by all means, if you have questions or something like that, there's not going to be like a Q&A thing at the end. Shoot them up. Let's see what we can do with them. Uh, and what I like to do is I like to sprinkle, as I can, very practical suggestions in as I go. One of the very practical suggestions that I've learned from TBL, but works in almost every class, is uh, the lovely reality of team folders. This is an amazing way to uh, very efficiently streamline the distribution and collection of materials, especially as classes get larger and larger and larger. So you have a set of team folders. You bring them in with you. Maybe you have a rule where the first member of a team, it's their job to pick the folder up. And then they put the stuff, whatever it is you're collecting in, and you carry the folders away. Very lovely thing. So you are all in teams. Um, what is included in here is basically almost all the material from today's session. We're going to just use the first sheet, which I'll pull out and show you in a second. Um, so don't start distributing everything to everybody at your table yet. We'll, we'll get there in due course. All right. So there's team one, team two. What I could do is actually just take a folder and pass it that way. And then I'll ask you to take a folder and pass it, well, Pass one that way. <laughs> there you go. And then if you could take a folder. Oh, I guess we're, uh, we don't have as many teams as I thought we need. Does every table have a folder? Fantastic. OK. So this is the, uh, I guess these two tables are sort of the symbolic front row where nobody wants to sit. Fair enough. OK. So we're going to jump right in. We're going to jump right in uh, and doing, doing some flip stuff. So what I would like you to do is um, there is a little thing in there called flip class readiness assurance test. It's the should be the top thing. There's one for everybody at your table, so take those four things out. This is a, a reading quiz over that article. It's a closed book quiz, so no cheating. Oh, oh yeah, take a folder, yeah. And I, I, I I'm grateful for you playing along as a student, right? I'm not going to, this is not going to go in your permanent record. Um, so what I'd like you to do is, is yes? <laughs> yeah, you, absolutely, you should use an alias. First two digits of your mother's maiden name, last four digits of your social security number. Um, so go ahead and take this as an individual. I'll give you f six, seven minutes, and then we'll move on to the next thing. All right, it looks like almost everyone's done. Done? Good? OK. So now what I would like you to do is actually take that same quiz again together as a table. And you're going to use a special scoring card at your table. Has anybody not seen these? No? Yes? OK. These are, it's like a combination between a Scantron form and a lotto ticket. 
There's a star underneath the right answer. And so here's how it works with your team. Your team gets three points if you get the star on the first scratch, two points if it takes you two scratches, and one point if it takes you three scratches to find the star. When you're done, I want you to bring your card up to me. So there's 15 possible points. There's five questions, right? Uh, bring your card up to me um, from your table. If we were doing this in reality as students, what I would do is I would say, put your individual test in the team folder, bring it to me, and I will give you a scratch card. That way I'd have individual accountability, and then you'd get this. But, you know, I'm letting it go this one time for you guys. <laughs> so, go ahead and talk amongst yourselves, come to consensus, and see what you can do. to bring these to you before you give them this, how do they remember the questions that they wrote down? That's a great question. When we're done, ask that so everyone can hear the answer. Yes, You done already? Ready. Nice. So how do you do this, uh, everything, well. Uh, yeah, asking that. So you got uh, 13 points. What number are you? Nine. Nine. First team's done. Other teams have five minutes. Twelve. And your team two. Okay, have all teams reported in? We actually don't have 13 teams. All right, all teams are done. All right, fantastic. So, um, what I like to do now is like time out as, as students, right? Let's take off the student hat. We can talk about the answers in a second and put on the teacher hat. Uh, and kind of diagnose what just happened. Um, so the individual quiz is an individual quiz, nothing kind of special about that. Um, but then you, you had, there was one question about moving from the individual quiz to the team quiz, which was if I collect the individual quizzes and have them, then how do you have the question still? And the answer to that is that I have a, an individual answer sheet and a quiz form. So they put the individual answer sheets in the, in the folder I take that, they keep the quiz form so that they have that to refer to. Yeah, but then they won't have which answer they put down. And if they say, I don't remember, then it's obviously called yes. Yeah. So what I do is I say, before you turn your individual answer sheet in, mark on the quiz form which answers you put. Just circle them. Yeah. And then they got to drop the quiz forms by the door as they go up. Yeah. Okay, so then um, moving to the, the group conversation. What was that like? Tell me about your experience with that. And I'm not looking for anything specific. Great. What? get to have people interact with the content in the way that you would hope that they would. They have to argue for their reasoning, mm -hmm. and they have to have done the reading, which mm -hmm. obviously if they haven't, mm -hmm. impacts everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think she's dropping hints at your table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah? We have some prior background knowledge about flip learning, so it was difficult for us because we kept saying, according to this article, yeah. and it's not really the other's like, well, I know this happened, but I don't remember if it was in the article. Oh, yeah. so we yeah. have to talk about yeah, the, I'm not entirely crazy about that article, actually, and I actually have some questions in there that uh, the article says and I kind of disagree with. Um, for example, the article doesn't talk at all about reading as an outside preparation <laughs> method. The, that, one, of the, one of the things about, and we'll talk about this in a second, but one of the things about the discourse around the flipped classroom is it's all about lectures on the web. Um, when in fact there's lots of ways that students can prepare ahead of time, right? Yeah, they can do mini lectures, they can also do curated readings, um, there's other platforms you can use and that kind of thing. But according to the article, um, it wasn't on there. And I actually do have an according to the article thing in there too because um, sometimes there will be content for which there's not necessarily, as we know, a perfectly right answer, but you do still want to motivate your students to do the readings and so you can say, according to the author, blah, 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 blah. So they at least get crystal clear on what this one person said. Yeah. Yeah, what else? I think it's helpful because you have to pay particular attention to what the question is, not your preconceived ideas that she's talking about the article. You have to actually read the question, which is what I find difficult to teach students. Actually read the question to the board. Yes. Rather than just, I saw teaching is it student resistant? Got it. And they boom, off to the next one. Boom, off to the answer. Yeah. That's such a good point. Um, and, and the flip side of that is they get 
really good at reading the questions to the point where they're like parsing the several different senses of this word and like, well, it could mean this and it could mean, that. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, you know, you can, you can wind up being a victim of your own success at that point. What else, what else? Did anybody convince their team of a like, wrong answer? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you're gonna get roughed up uh, a little bit later, right? Okay, so we all laugh about that, and like, so there was energy behind that, right? So if this was a real class, next time around, like, this fellow might not do the same thing he did, right? Um, and other people might really kind of press a little harder. In fact, I asked, I asked uh, some, uh, for a couple of classes, I had surveys where I asked students, did you convince your team of a wrong answer? And if so, did it affect your future behavior in any way? And were you convinced of a wrong answer? And if so, did it affect your perception of the person? And interestingly enough, the students were about, they were, I, I don't know how you can quantify this, but there was about seven times as many comments about how bad they felt having convince their team of a wrong answer versus, well, I'm gonna take a, what he says with a grain of salt a little bit. Yeah. These things, um, these things are pretty magnificent uh, in the sense of the extent to which that they can very quickly catalyze a team of strangers into a high performance learning team because of that immediate feedback. So if I'm sort of socially dominant and you're kind of quiet and we're on a team, I think the answer's A and you think the answer's B, on the first go, I'm probably gonna charm or bully, like convince somehow my answer onto the card. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Oh, it's not A. Well, you, you said B. Scratch, it is B. Oh, in that moment, the team learns that they had the right answer. The right answer did reside within the team, and it was just the way they communicated about it that cost them points. So the next time around, I'm gonna be more interested in pursuing your opinion. What would you put? and you're gonna be more interested in asserting it, and our teammates are gonna be more interested in making sure all the best thinking gets heard. So um, these things, uh, they cost about 20 cents a piece, and what's groovy about them is I never give a quiz with 50 questions on it, so I cut them. I do 10, I do about 10 questions per, and I have five of these per semester, so that means I need one card per team per semester, right? So it's something else. Yeah? Do you know of any apps or? Indeed. Yeah, electronic. So there is a platform called Learning Catalytics, um, which I actually worked with the developers to implement team-based learning functionality into. Um, so that's, that costs students 12 bucks a semester, 20 bucks a year. Um, it's a really, really cool platform. It's a, uh, it has 19 different question types instead of just like multiple choice and you know that kind of thing. But uh, there's a lot of, once the rhythm is set up, in a, in, a, in a institution that can become normal, but I didn't want to demo it here because people would have to create accounts and all that stuff. And this doesn't crash. Yeah. Any, anything else about this process? Yeah. But they also come in smaller sizes. They do come in smaller sizes, but it costs the same amount. Oh. Yeah. Bang for it. I do. So the first quiz is question one through 10, the second quiz is question 11 through 20, the next quiz is question 21 through 30. They just get little ones. Yeah. 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 An obvious comment, but uh, there were just two of us on our table at the time. The smaller the number, the quicker and easier it is to do it. So in your classes, you mm -hmm. obviously need to be very careful in determining the size of the groups. That is true. And it depends upon what you want those groups to actually do beyond this. Um, if you're going to be giving them increasingly complex intellectual tasks, you want to figure out what student characteristics will make it easier or more difficult for them to succeed at those and distribute those across teams as fairly as possible and that might mean bigger teams. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you guys banged this out really fast but you yes. also did really well which means you both read. Yeah. Huh? So yeah, there's gotta be points associated with both the individual and the group score, otherwise it doesn't really matter. However, you really don't need to attach much to the group in my experience, the group um, part of it because uh, remember when you and I were students, we would take our individual tests, we'd trundle up and we'd drop it off at the student's desk, and we'd go out into the hallway and we'd wait for our friend. And our friend would come out and we'd say, what was up with number four? What'd you put with that? How could you possibly have meant that? I don't know. And you'd like bitch about that question, right, all the way back to the dorm room. This takes that conversation, just moves it into the classroom, 
So this, this does a great job of generating what's called epistemic um, uh, unfreezing, right? So it rips open a student's need for closure around their understanding, and they're itchy to get the right answer, and this provides the right answer. So I only have like one or two extra credit bonus points that the score from the team session adds to the individual score. Yeah, cool. So uh, two more questions, and then we got to move on. Go ahead. Do you uh, mix up the team in the course of the semester? We had a situation where we had two students who were superstars in the class, mm -hmm. who were going to get every answer right, mm -hmm. and then the team will just kind of we're okay, you just fill it out. And um, to the extent that there might be value placed on the group scores, right. uh, that, that team might do as well if you don't mix up that star student among others. Uh, so the answer is no, I don't, um, because I don't mix them up once they're established, because the experience of humans in groups is that we need to acquire a certain amount of experience with one another before, before we're actually able to do much well together. So when you and I are brand new to each other in a group, a lot of our intellectual efforts are devoted to figuring out our place in the group. Like, are you a jerk or are you just sarcastic? How can I disagree without being labeled disagreeable? Like all of those things. And as we acquire experience with each other, we figure that stuff out. And then more of our intellectual resources become available to do learning and hard work. And every time you mix a group up, you start the clock again. So I don't mix them up. But what I do do is I do do is I, I make my best effort to um, make sure that whatever those characteristics are that would help a student be a rock star are distributed as fairly as possible across teams. So that so that, that doesn't, you don't get like a superstar team and a loser team, which is why you do need to actually be the one who forms the teams and not let students self-assign. Yeah, La we had one more question over here and then we'll get to you if I can. Yeah. So, I'm not sure if this uh, belongs here as a question. How do you teach creative arts? Ah, great question. And I'm asking not because I'm an art artist, mm -hmm. but because I'm a computer scientist, mm. and, but I like computer science because of the creative expression of solving a problem. Nice. And there is not a single one way of boom, this is A right. or C. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have several, I have some art examples later on. If I don't, if I don't get that itch scratched, let's get to it at the end of the semester, or end of the se session, <laughs> semester. <laughs> I'll be here all semester. All right, fantastic, that was great. So now, um, so that was the readiness assurance process, which is actually part of TBL. Oh, the last thing about this I'll say is the diagnostic effect of now that I've got these team scores, what I can do is I can lay them in front of me and say, look, every team got questions one through five correct. That material's been covered. Doesn't have to come out of my mouth. Either they got it from reading or watching videos or whatever, or they got it by explaining it to each other. So it's done, they got it. Questions seven through 10 were pretty hit and miss, so I think I need to do some explanation there. And the students at this point have been intellectually and emotionally primed to experience what I have to say as an explanation and not a didactic lecture. So they, they are much more grabby about it. Okay, moving on. So um, this is in the article. This is one of the passages in the article that I like. The value of the flipped classroom is in repurposing class time into a workshop. And I like focusing on that because so much of the discourse around flipping is about the out of class stuff. In fact, what we say in the, in the TBL community is the discourse around flipping is sort of agnostic about what happens inside the classroom. It's all about the online stuff, mostly. Team-based learning is kind of agnostic about the out-of-class stuff. It's all about the in-class like activity design. So the two make a nice pair. But what I do is I have a gloss of it. And so my gloss of the flipped classroom is that it consists First and foremost of in-class application activities. That's the heart of it. That's the reason why you do it, is to make time in class when we're face to face and we've paid all the prices of commuting and scheduling so that we can be in the same room at the same time and make, get the most value out of that, of making use of the knowledge, right? Um, and those are facilitated by the instructor. So it's, it's a different skill set than lecturing, for show, right? That facilitating a learning experience is not about being the, the lead role actor, it's about being the director, which means you're not in the spotlight, you're off stage for the most part. Students working together, that's not a deal breaker if they don't, but they're right there and they can explain things to each other in ways that you and I would never even think of. 
Sometimes the person who has just learned something is the very best teacher of it because they remember what it was like to have the misconception, oh yeah, 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 you're thinking about it like that. I was thinking about it like that too. You can't think about it like that. You gotta think about it like this. You and I may have forgotten what it's like to think about it like that 10 years ago, if we ever did. So collaboration is powerful for peer-powered learning. And the accountability, that a lot of us have said forever in higher ed, let me just finish this sentence and I'm gonna get to you. Um, yeah, I, I've been flipping my class. I assign stuff out of class. Students don't do it, so I have to cover it in class. Um, and so it's the accountability mechanisms now that, we're, that are focusing on. And that's what this was. The readiness assurance process is an accountability mechanism for preparation. And there's lots of different ways to do that, to get that accountability. It doesn't have to be like this. It can be out of class. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but their, their, the accountability part is crucial to the flipped design. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, so when we were talking about you know, dropping back to number two, uh, do students realize that they're learning from their peers or do they tend to think that they're teaching themselves? Ah, <laughs> the loud and um, grumpy ones will tell you that they're teaching themselves. <laughs> yeah. Did you get that question? Do students get that they're learning from their peers? Um, yeah, you're gonna hear, uh, I'm, like, like the article says, I'm paying to teach myself. You know, you're not doing anything. I'm paying to hear from the expert, not my, not my friends. Um, and so there does need to be some explanation up front about the rationale for this and about what, why it's better for learning. And what's great is there's a lot of research on it, and I'm gonna show you some in a second, where you can say this is why. Um, and the numbers don't lie. Yeah, great question though. You're gonna get that. I promise you you're gonna get that is at least one. Like, you're, I'm paying to teach myself. And, um, and there's lots of good reasons why that's a good thing, but you have to be careful how you phrase it so that they'll hear it. Yeah. Was there another hand or question? I've been kind of going high speed at this point because I want to get to the application part. That's, that's the juicy bit for me. Okay, awesome. So the last is um, <coughs> students can work together because they're being held accountable to prepare by engaging out of class materials. At this point, I do want to point out that in your folders, there are versions of the PowerPoint for everybody. So if you want to pull those out, if you want to be taking notes or something like that, you're welcome to. Cool. Yeah. Uh. Okay. So her question was, when you, do you, uh, when you have uneven teams, do you fix them? How do you fix them? When do you fix them? So um, there's a couple of, A, there's a couple of ways you can do your best to make sure you don't have uneven teams, right? So you think about, in my experience of teaching this class, what kind of students, oh, they're going to be tough, or oh, I'm going to have to work extra hard on them, or I don't even need to think about them because they're going to knock it out of the park all the time. Like, what are the kinds of students that you, that you know would be sort of above or below the average? And, and sort as much as possible. Um, B, the, the immediate feedback dynamic there is a real self-motivator, right? Like if I'm the guy that convinced my team of three or four wrong answers, like it kind of feels icky and I may study harder. Um, and then also the, the, you'll see that I put those, those scores up there. That's not competition per se, um, because it doesn't really matter what another team got for your score but it does trigger a sort of social comparison. So the team, it's like, God, guys, we don't wanna be the lowest team again. Like, we gotta dig in, right? So there's some aspects in play that will motivate that from not happening. However, um, if it does, um, I, I, it, in, in the structure that I use, TBL, which I'm not here to like pedal, but that's what I use, um, it, it happens very, very rarely because all these mechanisms are in place. Um, and so I, I resist, I, I don't, I never have had to reconstitute a team. Um, but if I had to, then I don't think it would be any different from any other situation in which a team is going down in flames. Um, but like I said, if you've got these systems in place, it really doesn't happen that often. Yeah. Good question though. Yeah. Okay. So. So that's a little bit about what it is, right? So the heart and soul of flipping the classroom are these in-class application activities facilitated by you 
that students can do together because they've been held accountable to do stuff outside of class. But does it work? So um, I, have, I made a little video of a faculty member I worked with at Northeastern who you'll see what her flip looked like. Um, and her findings actually replicate what is other people have found in the research literature. In traditional classes, students acquire content through in-class lecture and then do the more difficult work of applying that content by themselves on homework assignments outside of class. Flipping a class reverses this, moving content acquisition outside of class and moving application of content into the classroom where students can benefit from the presence of the instructor and their fellow classmates as they learn. At the heart of the flipped design are in-class application activities which are facilitated by the instructor that students can work on together because they've been held accountable to prepare by engaging out-of-class material ahead of time. Dr. Leslie Day flipped her gross anatomy course and found encouraging results in terms of in-class learning, higher level thinking, and student success in subsequent courses. My project was to analyze the effectiveness of a flipped classroom. So every time I was teaching, I was finding that in a traditional classroom, I was just regurgitating the information to them, and then I would anticipate they would be able to do the same onto a test, but at a higher level. So I went into research and I looked at what a flipped classroom was. It was kind of the new buzzword, so is there any evidence behind it? And I found that there was some great evidence, but there wasn't a lot for large classrooms, which I had, nor was there a lot on long-term retention of the material. So I took my class and I completely flipped it. And in the flipped classroom for my students, they did pre-recorded lectures online at home. They had concept check questions that they had to do prior to coming to class in order to have them be accountable for the material. And then in class, we looked at the material that they were still confused on and then also helped apply that material to a higher level of understanding. So they weren't just memorizing the facts, they were really being able to understand what those facts meant. This is a great place for discussion. So without revealing the correct answers, there's your spread. So who wants to help start orienting where we are here? Where is Front end chairs goes medial up down now to lateral. We do a lot of different active learning activities in there. Application of the material, it's an opportunity for students to truly embrace the material, to really own the material. But it allowed me to be with the students when they're truly learning the material, getting to that higher level of thinking, trying to synthesize the material. And that's what true instruction is about. That's where true facilitation is. And so my research looked at the grades from a traditional classroom to the flipped classroom. And I found that in my flipped classroom, they did 3% better, which is a another letter grade up from a B to a B plus. And additionally, I found that students in the flipped classroom were able to answer higher analytical questions on a final exam compared to students in a traditional classroom. So they were given the same questions, but the students in the flipped classrooms were able to think through the process on an exam. And then after the gross anatomy class, all my students go into kinesiology. And kinesiology is the direct application of gross anatomy. So gross anatomy is the the what of the muscles and the kinesiology is the why. How do we utilize it? How does your body move? So the students in the kinesiology course, when I looked at their grades, were also able to perform better coming out of gross anatomy in a flip model than in a traditional model. But what I found most intriguing was the group of students that it helped. It helped the lower end of the students, the students that were at risk for not doing well. So the students that came into my anatomy course with a low GPA did better in a flipped classroom compared to students coming in with a higher GPA. They both did well, but the, the lower end of the GPA did even better. And then students leaving my class that got a C did better in kinesiology coming out of a flipped classroom compared to their counterpart traditional model. Those are the students that I really wanted to affect, and so it was great to see that they were doing better both in my class and utilizing the material in long term. So, I mean, I show that just because it puts a face, right, in a, in a specific class on what a lot of the literature shows is that um, everybody does a little better, at least. Even the, even the high performers tend to do a little better, but the further down you go in terms of GPA or previous performance, the increase in the flipped classrooms, classrooms effectiveness gets stronger. So that's pretty cool. 
Okay, so I've done a lot of blah, blah, blah. And this is uh, a place where I think it's appropriate to just take a pause and kind of have you think about the model, your experience, maybe things you've tried, have worked, have not worked, and just kind of toss some stuff out there to me or to the rest of the room before we move on um, into kind of application activity structures. Like, let's hear what's going on with you. Yeah. So, um, the gentleman in computer science, I, I am teaching a programming course that's this. It's uh, half the this because I have a 200 level course where people can turn on the computer and they can, they can be in the course, in a 300 level course all at the same time. In the same room? Same room. Wow. And so it's like I cannot lecture about programming with these people that have skills to turn on the computer. So, what I do is I basically coach them where they have to go home and they sort of do hands on training. They come back to do their homework and then once they get to a certain level, then we do group projects. Interesting. So, the time in your class is segmented between your individual work, like, I don't know, from 1 to 1.30 or whatever, and then now let's get together and do group stuff, or is the individual stuff at the beginning of the semester and the group stuff toward the end? It's all, um, they work on what they want to work on in class. So they can be their individual homework, ah. what they want to work on in class, uh -huh. but you know, there's a few days for the homework, um, and then there's a few days for the group projects. Nice. Yeah, very cool. I will say that uh, something I believe is that community is the killer app. That like, just that, that thing right there. <laughs> um, having ongoing conversations after today is like super important. So um, if you can find a way to build some sort of, I don't know, regular coffee dates or something like that with folks at your table or folks who, who you came in with or folks who've got answers to your questions, do that because that's where the rubber meets the road. It's not with some clown on a PowerPoint. Yeah, thank you for that. There was another hand, I think I saw. Yeah. Yeah, um, I teach smaller classes in Bombardier. Mm -hmm. I really have a class of 25, she's actually class of 25. Mm -hmm. Two majors, and I'm thinking much of what I saw is not going to be useful, except I'm thinking now that group, group quizzes would be a very interesting way to have my students interact with the material that individually I'd be testing them on normal. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, take, I mean, take what's useful to you and leave the rest, much like a salad bar. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. What's really interesting, is there's a paper that's just coming out. Um, it's not out yet, actually. I just happen to know about it because I know the fellow who, who's one of the authors um, does the individual test, team test thing, and they did a crossover design um, where half the class did that, half the class just did it individually, then they flipped it. Then at the end of the semester, there was a final exam, and what they learned was, well, of course, the teams score better than the individuals, right? That's just, of course. But the, the material that they took when they were in the team condition, they performed on better as individuals at the end of the semester. So the activity of, of articulating their knowledge to one another and thinking things through and that kind of thing actually deepened their learning as individuals above and beyond their, their higher performance as a team. So it's juicy and it's fun, yeah. A first year pathology class in nursing. Uh -huh. And I did, I used to do that. Nice. Um, and last year I studied each cohort, that was my research. Mm -hmm. And the evaluation was really interesting. Actually, 63% of my students that participated, they said the best thing was the workshop. They learned more from the work, from the, anything in the class that was kind of supported me to really. Nice. the rest of it because I was really apprehensive on it because of course they do do the you know I'm paying you to teach me but this really gave support to me and, and feedback awesome the other thing I learned from that year is the buy-in at the beginning is so very important to teach them and tell them and spend that 15 20 minutes or half an hour to teach, tell them why we're doing it mm -hmm. because I had far less complaints or fallacies bucking the system mm -hmm. when they understood I was doing it for them rather than 
just doing it because I might find it easier. So the buy-in was a really important piece. So what did you say, like specifically, what were the ar like the arguments that you used to get that buy-in? I'm really curious. Um, the buy-in was part of the research, mm. that the feedback that I got from the students, because I evaluated every single, the, the, each mm -hmm. semester, mm -hmm. um, and that's what their peers told me. Mm -hmm. Their scores were better, mm -hmm. the research material. Mm -hmm. um, so I used kind of, everything that was possible. Right. I told them about adult learning principles that I'm very much a fan of mm -hmm. and the way adult learners remember things and learn and that they're responsible. Nice. And of course, this is the way nursing is as well. We work in groups, we have to communicate well, and we have to apply our knowledge. So, so questions. those kind of things were very important. I'm so glad this story went the way it went because I was expecting, I, I did this last semester and I'm like waiting for you to say, and it crashed and burned and I hated it. <laughs> Thank God. So, so, awesome. So, a question for you, especially in nursing, and there's other there's other um, disciplines too that are very um, exam like ultimate exam driven. The boards, the board exams, right? For nursing, medicine, engineering, that kind of thing. So, what I have encountered, especially in nursing, and I'd love to get your input on this, is some of the students are so locked into, yeah, making use of it's all well and good, but what I care about now is the board. Just give me the PowerPoints, give me the answers. Like, I'll, I'll learn that other stuff later. Like, that's what I care about. So how did you grapple with that? Well, it's really, it's really great because the NCLEX pass rate, mm -hmm. the, they're all the pass rate of questions on the NCLEX is application analysis of their knowledge. And okay. so if they don't have the knowledge and they can't apply it, they don't understand how to read those questions and how to apply the knowledge, they're not at the pass rate anyway, so it won't do them any good. So this prepares them to analyze and apply the knowledge that they have, mm -hmm. which is the pass rating in class exams questions. And, and there, those are multiple choice questions? Yes. They're all multiple choice. So we work them, we, we do the same format you, in yeah. our class. Okay. For examples, uh, we, use, we don't do select all the apply, but for examples, the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. To get their buy in, do you ever use a flipped classroom method? Like, do you ever give them reading material or a video about flipped classroom? Mm -hmm. um, Oh, yeah, like here, here's an interesting question. Like, we're gonna do a flipped classroom. Here's what a flipped classroom is. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I I don't use the word flipped classroom. I use the word TBL, team-based learning, just because that's what I do. Um, I have had colleagues who do that and succeed. I have also had colleagues who say, "Hell no, I don't want to give them a target." Right? Like the flipped classroom thing. I hate it. So anything they hate about the class becomes the the, the problem of the flipped classroom. Right? Um, there was a, someone I worked with at, at Texas who had 300 students in a class her very first time that flipped and one of a student started up a whole Facebook group just to complain about this class. Um, and that's what she learned is that the next semester she's, she didn't give it a name or a label or anything. She's just, this is how we do it in this class. This is how we're rolling. And she did much better. So it's kind of your style, I think. Yeah. Ma'am. I, I wanted to make the point that um, in my intro level COM 111 classes, um, I you know, because of the nature of a GER class, the makeup of that class is really diverse, and I have students with a wide range of skills and levels of, you know, experience in college and that kind of thing. And you mentioned earlier um, the point about students maybe who are um, more confident in their self-expression and that kind of thing, but I want to say that the students that I found that are really most empowered by it in, in those classes have been the really shy students. Mm -hmm. And one of my Alaska Native students wrote in a self-reflection piece that prior to the experience she had in groups in that class, that she had always felt like she was trampled on in her conversations in small groups and teams. And that, that she just ended up you know, being even more quiet and even more shy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was just exactly like we were talking about before where somebody said, wait a minute, you had B, and you know her star would rise. And then by the end of the semester, she was very comfortable and very confident in being able to express herself in that environment. And so if you have students that, that are shy and are quiet and are more reticent, this kind of an approach can really be very empowering for them. And a whole, you know, whole 15, 16 weeks of feeling like, wow, I do have something to say, and these people are gonna listen to me is exceptionally strong. I just, I when, can't. When there's objective evidence, right? Yes, Did you use exactly. these? Exactly, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. okay, yeah. When there's an objective evidence saying you know what you're talking about, <laughs> and, and, and even the bully who may be a little bit hurt that his answer wasn't right, 
has learned that he'll get a better grade if he listens to you. That's right. Okay, I'm listening now. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I just want to add, maybe add to that something that I thought. I suppose because I was the quiet, shy one always in class. And I think with what you're saying, not only kind of the, the affirmation that you do know what, what you're doing, but seeing other people failing, perhaps, not in a bad way, but just mm -hmm. being aware that, hey, you know, it's not always perfect, it's not always right. And right. I think for a lot of students nowadays, that is something you hear about successes, but you don't hear about the work that goes into. Yeah. And seeing that that super confident person actually sometimes gets along too is, I think, a bit of an eye opener. It no normalizes it. Yeah. yeah. And to be completely crass as teachers, a beautiful benefit of the team test with immediate feedback is well, without it, without it, when an individual student gets a question wrong, they're mad at you, the instructor. You wrote a bad question. But when they go to the team test and they find out that everyone else on their team got it right and they got it wrong, ah, I guess I got it wrong, right? The, the, the blowback is, is buffered, which is nice. Yeah. Part of the other thing I've noticed in my class is they're much more comfortable by the end. I got it wrong. Okay, I got yeah, it wrong. Yeah. And they're so much more open to not being so self-conscious about getting it wrong. They understand that that's a learning concept. Mm. And then some, oh, I used to think that too. Don't worry. You try thinking this way. And the conversations are amazing. Yeah. And they're, they're less focused on right and wrong grades. It's more about the conversation. Why? It's about why. Why? Right. why did you say to that? Figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and, and one thing that can be difficult is getting out of the way and just letting those conversations happen. You know, so what I do when those things are happening is I don't sit up here and check my email or something. What I'll do is you saw me doing is I'll wander around and I'll look at the floor. I'll be listening really hard to how the th words are being used and how explanations are happening, but I'm not looking at any one group because if you do that, then they all get clammed up. Um, and then another trick I learned actually in the TBL world is when facilitating a big discussion like this, and you may have seen it already, when someone's talking in our culture, when someone's talking to you, it's polite to kind of drift closer so they don't have to work so hard. But when you're facilitating a whole class discussion, it's actually better if you back away so that they have to talk louder and louder and louder and louder and make more and more eye contact with the people between you so that it includes more of the class. So that's a cool piece of teaching Kung Fu. That's part of the facilitation like <laughs> skill thing. Fantastic. One more and then I got it. No? Yes? No? <laughs> Some of you have participated in the Difficult Dialogues work about indigenous ways of teaching and learning, and this is very um, congruent with that in many ways, in that the emphasis really is on self-empowerment of the learner and moving the teacher out of the authority position, not that they don't have authority and have an extraordinary amount of wisdom to contribute, but um, to let the students have to begin to switch the paradigm that they've come through K through 12, which is very disempowering as a learner for most of them. And so I just, I was thinking about it because when people say we pay you to teach, actually the truth is they pay us so that they can learn. Yeah. Right? Different. So here's a, here's, a, here's a shock and awe phrase that I like to use um, when students, well, with anybody, but when students push back on that, and then we will move on. I like to say this, that no one in human history has ever taught anyone anything ever. Nothing is taught, things are only learned. And so it's the teacher's job to create the conditions where students are focused, motivated, uh, and guided, and given appropriate practice and feedback so that that learning, so that they can do that learning. So, all right, enough with my philosophy. Uh, okay, so um, one of the things about any form of flipping is that uh, you have to know what you want your students to be able to do, right? Since it's an application, you want students to apply the material. So you have to know, what does it look like when my students are applying the material? This teacher I worked with in large lecture, large history, American history lecture, actually, we'll see one of her activities. Um, she had a really interesting summer trying to think about, what does it look like when my students are doing history in a large lecture class? What, what is that? And she came up with some magnificent stuff. So in um, each of your folders, there's a, a front, pay, front and back sort of condensed version of Bloom's taxonomy, which many of you have probably heard of. 
And um, I have, you know, been doing this for 20 plus years, so I'm, I'm pickled in Bloom's taxonomy. But I still love it because um, those verbs, and it doesn't have to be those verbs, but they're very suggestive. It's a good prime for the pump of when I'm thinking about what are some of the ways I can describe what I want my students to do. I'll skim over old blooms, like, oh yeah, compare and contrast, yeah, 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 so that I can start getting some clarity on what it is that I want students to do. I'm not going to belabor that, I just, I like to give it to people. Also, in a very, very nutsy, boltsy way, when I'm writing a quiz, and I have decided there's going to be 20 questions on this quiz, usually by about question 15, I'm out of gas. You know, like, ah, man, I think I've covered everything. Pulling out old blooms, skimming those verbs. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I do need to them make them be able to distinguish this versus that. It's just a nice kind of kind of nice tool I use. So you do need to know what you want your students to be able to do. Um, and then they'll do some form of outer class prep for that, reading, videos, um, interviews, lots of different creative ways to do that, the in-class application activities. And then I put these as stripes across that accountability and student questions can happen out of class and or in class, right? So we just did an in-class accountability activity, the readiness assurance process. But you saw in the video that she has her students watch like little movies and interactive modules, and she has a little blackboard. Do you guys use blackboard here? Yeah, okay. So she has little blackboard quizzes that they have to take before they come to class. That's her accountability mechanism. Um, and then the last question on her quizzes is always, what about this was the most confusing or difficult for you? And so she can just skim those answers really quick before she goes into class, and then she has a sense of, wow, 75% of the class said it was this one thing, so I should kick off explaining that. And they know they don't know it, and I know they don't know it, and so it's going to be a very clarifying thing. So, uh, all right, good, we're making, we're making good time. So, so in-class activities, we're going to talk about the in-class activities and the out-of-class preparation methods. Um, these are things that are probably familiar to many of you, things like even little think, pair, share things. That's what she was doing in the video. She was using Learning Catalytics, that platform I referred to, for her in-class facilitation. Um, and they were just answering them, turning to their neighbor and figuring out what bone goes where and trying again. Practice problems, analytical games or debates, um, peer reviews of stuff that they've done outside of class is something that they'll do in class. And, um, and then case studies, like this is really where it, it gets, for me, really juicy because they've done this outside of class work and it's kind of the bargain you're making with them is, yeah, you're going to have to do more out of class stuff than you may have had to in the past. But the bargain is that when you come to class, you're going to be able to make use of that in really interesting scenario application activities. You're going to start to feel like your own skill set being built, right? And so I've extracted a couple of templates for what that can look like. What, what it looks like to make use of your material is going to be, of course, up to your discipline and your teaching style and what you find interesting. So, um, so take these as, you know, some tools you might be able to add to the tool set. Um, categorizing, rank ordering, pinpointing. So, a common pitfall here is that sometimes the, the, when people say, oh, I tried to flip a class and it sucked, it burned down, it didn't work, that doesn't work. And when I dig deeper into what they tried, what I have found is, yeah, they watched some lectures outside of class, and then I come to class and it's Q&A. Or I, I give them some lectures to watch outside of class, and then they come to class and they get more lecture. Um, and so often the, the, the design of an application activity is a creative act and it's not an easy one, right? That's why I'm going to give you some templates for it. Um, but that, the most common pitfall for in-class activities I have found is that they have missed the point of flipping the classroom, which is giving students practice applying, making use of the material. Yeah? I mean, it depends upon your goals and the, basically how long the thing is or what the thing. I mean, it, a whole two-hour movie could be your case study. Um, I've got a couple of one-sentence case studies here, so kind of up to you. Yeah. All right, so um, decision-making tasks are actually really, really good in-class application activities um, where groups for groups where they're not 
asked to produce a complex, uh, a complex question or a complex product, but instead make decisions like like you would do in your discipline, right? And I'll show you what, some examples of what that looks like. So, um, a very simple one is a scenario with a multiple choice question bolted on. Given a case or scenario, students must choose the best response from a range of given options. So, here's here's a scenario. You're a paramedic at a car crash, and this 37-year-old female victim has extreme damage of a certain kind to her chest. Do you put her in the ambulance on her back, on her side, or sitting up? Right? So um, this is a question that will have rooms full of medically trained people arguing um, based upon whatever the specifics of the damage are. But what's interesting is that poor paramedic has to put the woman in the ambulance. Right? Like, this happens. And so it's, it's not that academic. So this is a, an example of a scenario plus a multiple choice question that, that is, a, is a decision that they have to make. And one of the, one of, it, either as individuals or groups, I like groups. And then this is kind of my favorite form of clicker. Um, there's one of these in for you in each of you. you know, we're not going to do anything, else, but I like to show them to you. Because you give them a multiple choice question, and you say, OK, I'm going to give you three minutes to talk about it. And then on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to fold your card and hold it up, indicating the answer that your team has had. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to call on the team that raises theirs last. <laughs> right? So they can't do this thing. <laughs> right? Um, and then what's kind of cool about that, I mean, th there's advantages to clickers this doesn't have. You can't download you know, data. It doesn't take attendance or anything like that. But the visibility of it is kind of cool in terms of being a teacher, because you can have teams hold up these things. And then you can and you say, keep them up. And then you can sort of wade out into a puddle of color. Like, OK, you said A and you said B. So why did you say B and not A? And they'll start telling. And you say, don't tell me. Tell them. They, they said A. So they'll start talking. And then you say, OK, well, what? what and they, they start getting into it. And so you just have to kind of pick fights. Um, and it really gets them doing intergroup discussion really nicely. So, so this is the, the, the decision making model of a task in class for an application activity is lovely because you can do stuff like that. Um, so then what you can do is say, great, fantastic discussion. Now she's six months pregnant. Does that change your answer? And off they go into a deeper level of engaging the material. So a scenario with a multiple choice question is one format of a decision making task. Um, another is what I call pinpointing where given a complex image of some kind, a map, a graph, a photo, an image, a microscopic image, students must choose the best specific point for something. So that can be, this is the normal development rates for an infant. They can be given a set of data and they have to point, like, point where the, this infant is on that graph. What's the most dangerous part of this bridge specifically in terms of you know, various materials? I had one engineer saying, well, I can pinpoint it. It's actually between here and here. <laughs> Um, you know, you can give them some points around an airfoil and ask them to determine which, at which point are these certain forces maximized. City map. Where is the very best place to open a small dry cleaning business and why? So uh, you can use pinpointing for movies, like watch this movie and be ready to describe what, is the, what, what scene is the very best example of family systems theory in play. Something like that. Again, decision making. Um, sorting. Okay, so this is, this is my, my art history example. Um, given a collection of items, students must find the best way to arrange them. Either put them in a sequence, categorize them, something like that. So for example, this is uh, an art history task. Um, Celtic and Viking cultures are about a thousand years apart, but a lot of people confuse the material culture from both of them because they can look sort of similar. So in an art history class, you might want to have students recall what they know about the features of each, compare and differentiate artifacts of each style, each style, and within each category, be able to age them because art evolves over time. And that's reflective of cultural, important cultural evolution. So you might give them a collection of, uh, of pictures of Viking and Celtic art, and then say, OK, talk about this. And then um, what I want you to do is categorize them Viking Coulter, uh, Celtic, and then age them. And uh, then they can put them where they need to go. So this task structure actually came from nursing. Um, it was somebody who I worked with in nursing 
who was having students sort pictures of infants um, by age and by normal or abnormal behavior. So as an infant develops, at some point they're going to be like naturally holding their head online instead of flopped to the side and that kind of thing. And she had envelopes of little Xerox copied pictures and she gave them little bits of the blue gummy poster stuff that you'd stick posters to the wall with. And they literally had to stick them up where they thought normal, abnormal age and be able to kind of talk about them. Yeah, sir. An activity like that has the advantage too of getting students up on, on their feet and yeah. moving around. Yeah. Yeah. Another variation of this sort of sorting task that I've uh, done that um, students have like is where I uh, distribute to the class, uh, each member of the class gets a piece of paper that either has an image or um, some text or uh, some bullet points about what they've been studying. And I tell them that they need to sort themselves into so many teams. So, so for instance, I did it with the, we were studying the lymphatic system, and so they had to figure out which organ, you know, Nose, spleen, thymus, and and then so they had to look at all of the items that everybody else had and say, oh, we go together. Oh no, we don't go together. Mm -hmm. And then once they had created, once they found their team, then they did this made a little poster on the whiteboard wow. and they added additional information that they thought that. Interesting. And then they would some, uh, they present each team can present to the rest of the class, or we can go through each one and, and I can go back to the PowerPoint that they had studied from. And Nice. Cool. Right. And then forevermore, those you're like, yeah, we were a lymphatic system together. <laughs> and, you know, then, uh, uh, since we have a dedicated classroom for the medical students, does that stuff can stay up on the board today? Nice. Nice. Very cool. So, um, one little thing, quick thing about out of class preparation, and then we're going to get to like brainstorming with you and for you. So, some out of class preparation activities. So, you, the content, of course, right? Guided readings, internet resources, mini lecture, targeted mini lectures, um, screencasts that annotate documents. I just was ex like re educated about these by a faculty member who's in a history class. And s screencasting, is not, it's, it sounds like some stupid piece of jargon, but it actually is pretty cool. It's just these, you can get this free software now where you, it, you open up a window on your computer and it records anything that happens within that window. So a lot of software training programs use it, right? But what he does is he will load up uh, transcripts of lectures, like a Winston Churchill lecture, and it'll also record your audio. So he'll highlight part of the lecture and then just talk about it. Uh, hit record, highlight this, talk about it, highlight that, talk about it, you know, sit, hit save, put it up on a blackboard, and then students can load it, and it's just this neat little experience of him walking through the document with them talking about it. Um, so that's kind of cool. So there's the content that they need for the activity, but then of course, assessment and accountability, right? So um, low stakes quizzes do before class, online questions to answer or pose like Leslie does, reflection prompts that are due in class to get the class going. Common pitfall here is to think that full length lecture videos are the only and best preparation, okay? So, um, it's understandable that folks would think, well, I've got these things that were taken by Captivate. I'll just put them online and we'll be good. Uh, for a lot of reasons, um, both research and um, 10 minutes pegged on a video. Uh, when I was at UT, we were one of the edX schools and the data that they have of the hundreds of thousands of people is that right at about 10 minutes, people stop watching. Um, so little targeted nuggets, basically, v lecture, lecture nuggets, if you, can, if you can make those. Or find them, like, there's a lot of stuff out on YouTube, it doesn't have to be you. Um, uh, so chunking is what you wanna <coughs> accomplish there. Curated readings work just fine. And then there's some cool, for, uh, for folks who may not have seen this, there's, there's some cool PDF annotation, coll collaborative annotation software out there. There's one from MIT that's free, called NB, and, uh, let me pull that up. I want to show you a picture of what it looks like. So what this is, is this is a, a, a platform that you, whoops, that you um, upload a PDF to and your students log in. Har Harvard's using this now. Your students log in and they can select a passage 
and ask a question about it. And then they can answer each other's questions about that passage. It's all one centralized document. I mean, a Google Doc might do this, but it's nicely threaded. So this is nb.mit.edu. Are you saying N like Nancy? N like Nancy. It's like Nota Bene, the NB. Yeah. Um, and so this is a physics text PDF where students are reading through it and they're asking questions, blah, 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 blah. And students can, can decide whether when someone answers their question, if they want to get an email or something like that. So this is just another form of out-of-class preparation. It doesn't have to be you on video. It doesn't have to be videos at all. Um, so that's kind of a cool, cool platform that's being developed. Yeah? So where is the lower bound on the videos? So 10, 10 minutes is the, the upper bound? Rule of thumb-ish, yeah. Uh, but I've seen 12 to 36 seconds videos. Uh -huh. Interesting. So there's a... Did that frustrate you? I knew what they were talking about, so it didn't frustrate me. Okay. Uh, I would say that's probably highly contextual, yeah. right? I mean, if it's like some super quirky thing on a menu, 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 menu that I'd never find, all right, 12 seconds, that was totally worth it. Um, but if it's something that's just sort of trivial and I got to pay the download time while I'm watching YouTube spin, I might get grumpy. I would say that's contextual. Yeah. Okay. Good times. So now. I have for you uh, this is the part where I don't want you to get too hung up on the fact that I have this giant worksheet for you. <laughs> um, so what I have here is, and I love these, these like placemat worksheets, um, is my definition, basically, right? In-class application activities facilitated by the instructor, students can work on together because they're accountable, blah, blah, blah. And the idea is I'm going to hand out one of, for each of you, and I want you to take 10 minutes to do just one thing, and that is skim over these questions and s don't necessarily feel like you need to go in sequence. Like, you might have, from like the pinpointing activity, you might have got an idea like, oh, dude, that was so, I got this killer idea. Like, write that down in the activity section. Don't worry about the objectives yet. Like, don't worry. Like, the purpose of this is to start a thinking process for you to collect thoughts about what a flipped module might look like. You don't have to flip your whole class at once. Um, so it's sometimes better to do kind of like, in, like increasingly successful small steps. Um, so I'm going to give you 10 minutes to just Fill in what part of this you can, and then we'll see what folks were able to do and get some feedback from each other. And I'm going to give you some examples, too, so that you have those to work from. No, in fact, there are examples in your folder. There, that art history, that Viking Celtic art history example is in your folder. And then the American history one is in your folder as well. So look back in the PowerPoint handout if it's useful for you to look at like pinpointing, uh, um, sorting, like use those to jog your, your thinking if that's helpful. Okay, I want to I wanna have time for um, a little bit of kind of reporting out and cross-pollinating to the extent that we can. Uh, I realize that's a pretty hefty worksheet to just plop on you and then give, give you like eight minutes to work on. But I saw some people like scribbling madly with coming up with some really good ideas. So uh, what I would love to hear is an example or two. Um, here, here's another piece of teaching Kung Fu. Did someone at your table, you think, come up with something good? Who? Okay. So if someone came up a, a, at your table, if someone at your table you think came up with something good, raise your hand. Not you, someone else. Oh, come on. So the longer this goes on, the more insulting you're being to each other. <laughs> I saw a hand. So someone at your table came up with something good. I just wanted to be complimentary, but I didn't have time to talk <laughs> about didn't it. Didn't have time to talk about it. Yeah, came fair up enough, fair enough. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of a nice move is that if you've had time to talk about it, you can say, ooh, did someone at your table have any really good ideas? And that way, I can out you 
as someone who has had some good ideas, um, and it's a compliment, right? And I'm, and I'm kind of like shoving you out there and in a positive way. So who wants to be the first penguin in? Ah, ha, ha, it's on. Thank you very much. All right, so what'd you come up with? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I've been teaching the Marine Mammal and Necropsy course, so I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. uh, so it's the penguin thing, really. Yeah. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, so yeah, so trying to think like, so we just did, I haven't used quilt techniques before, um, so we just did an anatomy lecture, you can watch kind of the lights turning off and you just slowly giving them all this information. Mm. And you can hear seriously scribbling and zoning out. So mm. trying to, again, like David said before, split them into groups and then you know, have them do exercises where they have to, you know, trace the flow through the circulatory system or just give them you know, different groups of anatomical systems to have them work out amongst themselves and what key pathological findings you might find in each of those. Nice. Yeah. Because there's so much, there's really good websites out there now that they can walk through and, and look at a 3D model of a heart and spend that long and stuff. So there's no need for me to just like talk, to talk about it. Yeah, very cool. Nice. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, I, I had Tim's suggestion actually at another table of yeah. true B students and having them find their group based on these characteristics. Because I have three different uh, concepts that I try to. That I work with uh, every semester trying to help students differentiate among them and, and, and they struggle every semester even though we go over and over and over and mm -hmm. I come at it every which way I can but I had never thought about having them right, physically group themselves together and you know so that, so that they're part of one concept or another and so to me to me that idea of the this is how the the Very nice. Very active. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm teaching health education this semester, and my book discusses nine theories that you can use to develop implementing and implement interventions. And so for each of the theories, my students have to pick a health problem, and I have a deck of health problems from the Healthy Alaska 2020. Um, so either they have one that they've been working on, or they draw from the deck and have to design an intervention, and then tell us what that would look like. And sometimes I also make them draw like a particular population group. So then they're thinking about a new problem in a new context in a new theory. Because they're very, our book's really dry. Mm. There's a lot of arrows and boxes. And, mm -hmm. But when you think about, you know, we're talking about perceived severity. That's, you could duck it. And perceived susceptibility. You personally, rather than um, just looking at the boxes and arrows, mm, they start nice. thinking about, how would I get my neighbor to understand this? How would I get my kid to understand this? Nice. Personalizing it, yeah, it makes it much more intimate to them and motivates them. It's a motivation. It makes it concrete instead of abstract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it stays abstract, they never actually have to. Yeah. yeah. So can I ask you, you, you actually finished the, sh the whole sheet. <laughs> so, no, I'm looking at you. Can I ask what you, what you came up with? I didn't finish the, the whole sheet, okay. but I'm happy to share what I came up with. Um, I was actually thinking of, I've tried, so I'm not currently teaching any courses, I'm, I'm a postdoc here, so I was thinking of how I could use some of the research I'm working on currently to turn it into to teaching materials, and I was thinking about uh, a, a case study um, based on research, so I was thinking of learning objectives of how students could use information from, I'm, I'm an ecologist to look at, um, that's the climate change on ecosystems, so how students could use information from um, models of what we think is going to happen in the future climate and then information from a specific ecosystem to anticipate what some of the changes we might see and then mm. could they represent those uh, graphically. Um, that's the best part of that. Wow, so like taking what you've learned from this, what happens if you put it into this context? What would you predict would happen? Nice. Very cool. And then they'd be really interested to see what other, other groups came up with if it's different. And then they want to argue, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Nice, very cool. Any last ones to be, yes sir? I teach uh, poetry, not how to write poetry, but how to understand poetry in the literary tradition. 
and my students got out this semester and they come into the classroom and to them poetry is a foreign language and the luck the professor knows the correct interpretation. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a guessing game with what's going on in the home. I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them a poem and I'm going to make them have them, I should say, use the six learning outcomes that are up there as applied to a particular poem. But it's not just going to be a learning outcome. It's going to be what they think is the best learning outcome that they can come up with to understand the poem. Wow. Which I think will be quite interesting. And I can do this next week. So you, you, have, <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have six learning outcomes, and you'll say, of these six, which do you think gives you the most insight into this poem? Yes, and then, but I'm still going to get them to do all six, and then within, within each yeah. of those six, yeah. I'm going to force them to say, why is that important to remember? Why is it important to understand? Yeah. Why and why evaluate things? And which of these was the most fruitful? Yeah, yeah. So there's your art answer. <laughs> See? Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's good stuff. I, wow! See, you know you're a geek when stuff like that just gets you awesome. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much. All right, so um, we have a few minutes left, and I, I want to uh, answer a question that was asked. I want to give somebody an opportunity to make an announcement, and I want to give somebody else an opportunity to make an announcement. So a question was asked, when do you form your teams? If you form your teams, do you do it before class? Do you have them fill out a survey online? How do you do it? The way I do it is I have a little half-page sheet that's got the questions on it that I care about. They fill that out on the first day of class, second day of class, if they add, you know, late. Then I go home and I sort them into teams. And then on like the second week, beginning of the second week, I inform them what teams are on. And I ask them to just sit in their teams for the rest of the semester. And what that affords me is the ability to say like, okay, turn into your teams and do this. Okay, now come back. If they're sitting with their teams all the time, you can just flip them in and out really quickly. Um, and then in terms of the out-of-class preparation materials, someone wanted to make announcements from the College of Education. Go for well, it. Well, um, I didn't realize that Sean only was going to. Well, I can get back to you. Are you oh. Ready? oh, well, I just want to point out that um, we're, Laura and I and, and Debbie Cannon are instructional designers. We're going to do some follow up. So, a lot of the things he mentioned and some of the technologies he's mentioned, we're doing follow up workshops. So, if you're interested, um, you'll find that in your email. But um, specifically in the college that we teach a lot of our classes online. And I just want to say that all of these things can be done in Blackboard Cloud or Ace. We have breakout rooms. We have the ability to do every single thing that he mentioned. Nice. Cool. All right, and I, I want to say um, just quickly that I appreciate very, very much the hard work of a lot of people who um, have, have put this together. I wanted to thank Lisa for her work on this. I know mean, Kara did some um, helping her too, and Esther for Renee Carter Chapman's office also helped us. Um, and the faculty who took Michael out to dinner last night, although I don't know that that would really work. <laughs>
we will be able to make it available to you guys via the cafe website or, or something along those lines. I have faith that there will be something online. <laughs> Actually, real quick before we go, because I want the virtual people to be able to um, see, we had just a couple things on the question you just said about um, creating a team. Tim Benningfield said that he uses a learning styles quiz to create his teams in their basic classes and a leadership style quiz in his advanced upper division classes. So just another idea mm, nice. um, from our friends in the virtual world. Want to make sure we include them. Thanks, friends. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you everybody Sorry. for playing along today. I really appreciate it. Go forth and flip as is comfortable and uh, appropriate for you and be in touch with each other because that's what makes it workable. <laughs>